Hello and welcome to this video from Mr. Hill Science Stuff. This is the last video in the bio uh, in the biodiversity topic, and also the last video if you're doing it in the same order that I am in the AS level on this side of the course. So it's quite an important one. At the end of this, you'll have covered all of the theory for the biodiversity unit and perhaps even all of the theory for the AS level. Okay, so on, in this one we're doing an introduction into investigations of habitats and variation. So we're going to cover all of this for the AS level standard in one go. There is a more in-depth version at A2 level, right, the full A level standard, but we're not going to go into that today. So what we are going to cover here, look, we've been working our way through all of these uh, different bits here that aren't highlighted. So today we're going to look at this little bit in the box at the bottom there, which is on quantitative investigations of variation within a species, for example, collecting data from random samples, calculating a mean, a standard deviation, and interpreting what those values mean in terms of uh, means and standard deviations in terms of the environment. So there's going to be a few examples today, there's going to be a few things to do, and because it is the last video, we're going to do a few things that are a little bit special. Okay. Bear in mind that bit in the red at the bottom there, very important, over that side, um, that you will not be required to actually calculate standard deviations in a an exam setting so this video will focus more on how you use them what they're for when you would apply them when you would use statistics and what they show you rather than actually how you would do them in a math style question okay so we're going to look at what sampling is and why it's used very quickly we're going to explain what's meant by standard deviation and when to use it and hopefully a lot of this will be recaps and covering stuff that you've already done before so I'm going to run you very quickly through an introduction to how to sample stuff properly Hopefully you know this a little bit from GCSE. It's quite similar, but with a little bit more rigor. Okay, so I'll give you three questions you've always got to answer if you're going to go and do any environmental work, any sampling of anything in an environment. Okay, you want to answer the question of what is there, where is it, and how many are there. So when you're looking into diversity and variation in an environment, those are the three questions really you want to answer. Now it is of course impossible to count absolutely everything if you're going into a woodland or a forest or any any form of ecosystem it's impossible to count everything and also if you did count everything you would be being incredibly invasive you would damage that environment so dismantling a whole rainforest and putting everything in little piles to count it all would obviously destroy that rainforest so you've got to strike a balance between accuracy and non-invasiveness okay so the key term, another key term we're looking for here, is we go for a representative sample. So we make sure our sample represents what's actually there. And that can be quite tricky, as I'm going to illustrate to you with this little video here from my recent expedition over to Fiji. And we genuinely were the first people ever to go into this patch of forest and try and work out what was there. And hopefully you'll be able to see that's not actually an easy thing to do in a couple of hours. Okay, so hopefully you can see from that that there is an awful lot of complexity there and considering nobody would ever been in there to do any ecology before, it's obviously an incredibly difficult thing to do. We were there doing a habitat survey which is basically the big structural stuff, the trees, the under canopy, all those large structural things rather than the smaller um, samples in there for animals and insects and so on and so forth and there were other teams going in there to do that, uh, there for later videos. So in terms of sampling, what is it and how do we do it? Okay, well, you may remember from GCSE, things you always have to do when you're doing this kind of work. You do lots and lots of samples, and the key word here is you eliminate bias. So if you do several samples, you eliminate the chance of one of them being randomly peculiar, having loads of anomalies in it. Um, it says easy three or more average readings. I would say for any serious uh, type of sampling, three is really poor. Uh, 5, 7, 15, 20, as many as you can possibly get in. The more you get in, the more robust your data is, so you eliminate bias. So a uh, random sampling is a way of achieving this, uh, that you basically have everywhere in the environment has an equal chance of being sampled. You sample randomly until you get what you believe to be a representative unbiased sample. And the idea, the key here, if you've done this well, is that any differences you spot between environments 
reflect real differences in the populations that sample, reflect real variation in the populations that are sampled, and not just something weird that you did with your sampling methods. Okay? So, your old friend the quadrats, the most useful piece of biology equipment if you're out in the field, uh, usually the ones you've used for the frame quadrat, they're about half metre by half metre in size and they mark out a square. They can be any size of course, from a tiny little thing that you put under a microscope, a little graticule you use for sampling algae or plankton out of seawater, right the way up to hundreds of miles by hundreds of miles squares that you sample from space to look at something like the Great Barrier Reef. They're basically just an area, a, marking, a way of marking out areas on an ecosystem. Most of the time, for your purposes, though, you'll use a standard frame quadrat, which will be half a metre by half a metre. You are making some assumptions, though, when you place quadrats around an environment, that you're only sampling stationary organisms, that they must not move. Okay? Please, please, please do not go and try and sample deer with a quadrat, because then you're just playing hoopla with the antlers, and then they'll run away with your quadrat. That is not a sensible way to sample uh, mobile organisms. There are other methods for doing that, which we'll go into uh, in later A, uh, A2 or A, full A-level videos. The quadrats obviously must be chosen randomly, or they must be chosen in another unbiased manner. So you must not bias them based on what's easy or what's convenient. So therefore, you, every organism has the same chance of getting into the, one of those quadrats. So the sample you've taken represents the whole population. Okay, very important. So the basic approach is you do not throw the quadrat over your shoulder. If you've ever had a biology lesson where a science teacher has told you to throw a quadrat over the shoulder, they have taught you wrong. Right? If you throw something over your shoulder, it is more than likely going to land about three meters behind your shoulder. That is not random. That is biased. Okay? So you've got to take the whole habitat, grid it out, and randomly generate numbers as coordinates and place the quadrats accordingly. Machines are very, very good at being random. You are not. And I can illustrate this with three simple questions. Okay? First answer that comes to mind is the one you want to use. Think of a grey animal. Think of a number between 1 and 10, and name a vegetable. If you said elephant, 7, carrot, then my point is proven. Okay? So you grid the habitat, you randomly generate the numbers as coordinates, and you place the quadrats accordingly. So, to give you an idea of what that looks like, this might be a map of our habitat. If the habitat's too big to put tapes out on the ground, you put a grid over the map, you generate your random coordinates, x and y, and you place your quadrats here, here, here. Now we've been lucky there that those quadrats seem to, by eye, have given us a representative sample of the environment. That might not happen, right? You might end up with uh, three in one corner, in which case you would repeat your quadrats until you got what looked like a uh, reliable and representative sample. And there are more rigorous ways of assessing whether you've got a, a representative sample, like species accumulation curves, that go beyond the scope of this video. Okay? So, it doesn't matter where you are or what kind of environment you're in, this is the process you have to do. Laying tapes, random numbers, and placing quadrats accordingly. It doesn't matter where you are, as this video will illustrate from our 2017 expedition to the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. <laughs> So as you can see, the rules are the same wherever you are. So our key points to this point, randomness, if you're doing that, eliminates bias. There are other ways to achieve this, to eliminate bias, but that is very important. Okay. Next one, a large sample size makes sure that the sample is representative. So if you've got an unbiased representative sample, you may well be able to rely on your results. Okay. Now, there's different ways when you've got your sample as to what you're going to do. And again, we're only going to talk about this very, very quickly because it pertains to what's coming up, which is what do you do when you're looking in the quadrat? Now, there's different ways that you can count and measure what's in the quadrat, percentage cover versus frequency. Frequency is just count the thing, how many that times that species crops up. Very easy for something like daisies, one, two, three, easy. But it's not very easy for something like grass or moss because how do you define what's one plant and is it practical to count those things? Therefore, those ones you would use percentage cover. You would estimate the percentage cover, uh, and there are various ways of doing that as well, that 
that species takes up in a quadrant. Now, if you're looking at plant species, bear in mind that number can come to over 100% because plants can be on top of one another. Okay, It's a three-dimensional space. And you can think yourself about what the pros and the cons are of each of those uh, scenarios. So, as this is the last video in this course, I'm going to show you something a little bit different now and give you some data that you are going to work on yourself. Okay, welcome to my garden on this lovely sunny day. As you can probably see behind me, I've got two areas of lawn there. The one in the front here that I mow quite heavily and the one at the back there that I've deliberately left pretty unmowed, planted a few things in the back there. I haven't been here very long. I'm doing that deliberately to see if I can increase diversity in that grass. I genuinely have no idea if it's working yet. So that's what we're going to try and find out. So to do that, I'm going to need a quadrat, I'm going to need some tapes, I'm going to need a random number generator, and I'm going to need something to write my findings down on. Okay, let's get that stuff together. Okay, got my notepaper, random number generator, tapes, and quadrat. Hang on a minute. I don't have a quadrat. Hmm. I do have a big pile of wood and some tools. Hmm. All right, let's try that again. No paper, random number generator, tapes, and quadrat. Like I've always said, there's no useless subject at school, particularly not DT. Right, on we go. Right then, so now I've got the kit together. Me and my new quadrat can go and discover whether or not there's actually a difference in the diversity of species in the lawn I mow and the lawn that I don't. Okay, now obviously it's pretty clear to see there's going to be a difference in length, but of course that's not how we do things in biology. We need to get some data and do some stats, okay, so we can actually prove whether that difference in length is significant or not. So I'm going to gather that data in the same way that I've described to you already, grid it out, random number generator, get some data, and then I'm going to show you that data and you're going to tell me whether or not there is a significant difference, one, in the length, and two, in the number of different species and the abundance of those species in these two environments. Okay, so that's my data gathered. There it is. I'll put a version of that up in the video and in the folder. A uh, nice bit of carpentry for an afternoon. Okay, so now we've got some hopefully useful data. We should be able to tell some things about my garden. And one of those things that we should be looking for is whether or not the difference in the length of grass between the lower part of the lawn and the upper part of the lawn is actually significant. Whether there's a real difference there or whether they're so similar that actually that doesn't really matter. And one measure we can use for that, of course, on a quite basic level, is the standard deviation. Now, of course, we can take an average length and we can compare that and look at those are different. But how different are they? OK, in uh, data set A, as you can see, all of those uh, points, apart from two outliers, are clustered around the mean. Whereas in B, all of those points are more spread widely up to the limits of the range. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that for A and B, they would have the same mean and the same range, but that's not a useful way of talking about the uh, the environment, talking about the data. Okay, Those outliers should really be eliminated from what you're talking about. 
So that's where we get to something that's a little bit more robust, a little bit more useful, which is the standard deviation. Okay, so standard deviation is not overly influenced by our outlying values. Okay, it's much better measure than range. Okay, so here we've got the, the sort of golden rules. And I'm assuming a basic knowledge here on your part of what a normal distribution is. Okay, if you don't know that, then go back to the beginning of this module and have a look at the first videos where we discuss that in more detail. Um, and what we know about standard deviations is that when you calculate the standard deviation and add one standard deviation to the mean and take it off, that range around the standard deviation, one uh, around the mean, one standard deviation up and one standard deviation down, gives you 68%, or just over two thirds of the data. So that's a really useful measure because it eliminates the outliers. Okay, if you went two standard deviations up and down, right, then you would have 95% uh, of the data, or almost all the data, and you just eliminate those real extreme cases, which is a much better way to to work. Okay, than just using range. So the smaller the standard deviation, the more reliable the data set, the less variable it is. And really what you're looking for when you're looking at two data sets, like grass lengths, is you're looking for overlap. Okay, if there's a massive range, then it's likely that the two sets overlap, and we can't really say that those two data sets are significantly different. Okay, whereas if they don't overlap, standard deviations don't overlap, we can say, well, two thirds of the grass uh, lengths in this one here don't overlap with two thirds over here. All right, that means they're probably significantly different. Okay, so this is an example using um, put this up. All right, this is an example using a mass, for example, of 10 kilos. So our mean is 10 kilos in this one. Um, two thirds are within one standard deviation of the mean. Whereas if you went meaning if you went up. One standard deviation, which in this instance for this data set is 0 0.5 kilograms, and down, it would mean that two thirds of the data, right, are within nine and a half and ten and a half kilos. Okay, so 68% are within nine and a half and ten and a half kilos, and 95% are between nine and eleven kilos. Okay, so the rest of them are just these outliers, which really must be fairly exceptional things, and you should probably ignore. Okay. So you don't have to know how to calculate standard deviation in an exam. Okay. Therefore, there is no real need, apart from in terms of your general mathematical ability, for you to know how to calculate standard deviation um, at all, really. The cheats way using your calculator is absolutely legitimate. Okay. So I'm going to show you using my calculator here right, on this other webcam exactly how to make your calculator do standard deviation for you. OK, so I'm sorry if you've got a different, more sophisticated mathematical calculator than my one. This is the standard scientific calculator that's been in circulation since I was at school. And if you've got anything fancier, well, you're probably a better mathematician than me. So tough. OK, so with this one, first thing we need to do is put it into stat mode. Now, for me, I hit the mode button and you can just see there that stat mode is mode number two. So mode number two, please. And I don't need to worry about all of that. So out I come. Then I need to find my stat menu. Now, for me, my stat menu is over uh, number one there. We've got a little white bracket and it says stat. So I would go shift and then one to go into my stat menu. And it asks me, okay, what do you want to do? And of course, the first thing I want to do is I want to put some data in. Okay, I want to put my data set, whatever it might be, my results from my experiment, into the calculator. So here's two. And I'm just going to put some random data in here. I'm going to go one. And hitting equals puts it in there. I'm going to go 2 equals 3 equals 4 equals 5 equals 6 equals. And that's all gone in to the calculator. And that's stored in the calculator's memory. OK, I come out of that. Right, that's all safe. That's all stored. I go shift and then into my stat menu again. And now I can ask it questions about that data. OK, now uh, in terms of standard deviation, what I want, they're basically variances. So I want 4 var. It's a type of variance. So I hit number four, and I've got a load of different options here. I've got n. If I hit one, it will count the number of things I put in and give me the, the total number of pieces of data I put in. If I hit two, it'll give me the mean. So let's try that. Two equals, there's my mean, three and a half. Big surprise there. If I go back into my stat menu, back into my variances, then I've got here three 
and four, which are different standard, which are different standard deviations. Now I always tend to use number three, as those of you who are mathematically sophisticated will know, there are different ways of measuring statistical variance from a mean. Neither is more valid than than the other. As long as you're applying it consistently within one data set, it is fine. Okay, so I'm going to go for number three to get my standard deviation there. Okay, and that gives me a standard deviation of 1.7. So my mean was 3.5, my standard deviation was 1.7. So if I wanted to know where 68% of my data is, I'd go 3.5 plus and minus 1.7. Okay, now you probably should practice doing standard deviation manually at least once in your life, but for the purposes of required practicals, lab work, anything where you're actually having to do that for an examining purpose, using a calculator is absolutely legitimate. You will not be asked to do that in an exam, do it manually in an exam. Okay. What you will be asked to do, however, is interpret what it means, Okay, what these things mean. So, this is the key point you need to take away. So you, uh, to find out the spread of values about the mean is why you use standard deviation. If you've got a very large standard deviation, you've got a lot of variation, the data is quite spread out. Small standard deviation, you've got less variation, and the data is very clustered around the mean. Remember to look for overlaps. So, as a final task in this module, here is what I want you to do. We're going to go back to the data from my garden. Okay, now the easy question is, is there a significant difference between the lengths of grass in my two lawn areas? So what's the mean and standard deviation for each and do they overlap? Okay, pretty straightforward. Harder is how would you use the species data to decide if there's a significant difference between the species in the two areas? So you decide on what statistical tool and how you would use that data. Now this is more like what you're actually going to get in an exam. You won't be asked to do the statistical tests, but you might be asked to suggest what statistical test, what data you'd use, how you would use it, or interpret the data that, that the examiner has given you. So that harder question there is a more realistic idea of the kind of thing you might be given if asked a question about mathematical variation within uh, an AS or an A-level paper. Okay, and that is not only the end of this lesson, it is the end of the biodiversity topic, and it is also, depending on how you're running your course, the end of the AS level. So congratulations, you have reached the end, well done. Right, there's the data, I'll leave you with that. Enjoy, and hopefully I'll see you back for more videos in a little while. Bye-bye.